Hi, everybody. This is Steve Bennett. It's my privilege today to introduce Julie Bell. Julie Bell was born in Beaumont, Texas, and focused her art studies on life drawing of the human figure. After establishing a world-renowned career as an illustrator in the popular culture world of video games, movie posters, Marvel comics, and all things fantasy and rock and roll, as well as worldwide advertising campaigns for Nike, Toyota, Old Spice, Ford Motor, and others, she has turned her attention to her personal artistic work. The subject of her work ranges from imaginative realism to contemporary wildlife paintings. She has won numerous awards and her work has been presented at museums and featured in many art publications, including Fine Art Carnassur and American Art Collective. In addition to her work as an artist, Julie has been named one of four jurors for the third iteration of the Bennett Prize for Women Figurative Realist Painters, the call for entries for which is now open. Julie Bell, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank I'm you. I'm so happy a, to be here. This is fun. A, it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to have you, and uh, I'm delighted you're with us. Um, perhaps you can start by just telling us where you are and now how, how things are going and uh, give us a sense of what's going on in your world. What well, are you doing? Are you, where, where, where's home for you? Well, right now, um, I mean, for the last 33 years or more, <laughs> I've lived in Pennsylvania and uh, I'm originally, as you mentioned, from Texas, but um, I've lived in a lot of different places and I love, I love calling Pennsylvania home. It's just a perfect place. We're kind of close to New York City and Philadelphia and, you know, so you've got some big cities and New England and the mountains and the ocean isn't, everything's kind of within a driving distance and it's great. Well, so, that eastern seaboard thing, right? You know, you're yeah, on, yeah. You got access to New York and Boston and and the mountains and the, the beach, mountains, the, whole... the beach. It's all cool. How yeah. how slick? That's that's. Slick. <laughs> well, you know, you don't really need any introduction. You're a a, a famous, a, a, a very well known uh, artist. Uh, but I think for uh, our audience, it's important to point out that you began your career as a fitness and artist model, did you not? That's right, I yeah. did. And yeah. uh, a, a lot of uh, female artists, I think, uh, painters, uh, began similarly, uh, uh, perhaps most prominently Suzanne Valadon, who posed for Morisot, Renoir, Toulouse, Lautrec, uh, and a variety of others. Um, as a I would imagine that these, that you know, what you're saying is true. But I'm pretty sure. I bet you she was aspiring to make her own art before that took place. When you think, uh, having read some of the biography, it's not perfectly clear. Um, mm. Uh, I, I think the general consensus is that uh, maybe she uh, maybe she got hooked by watching uh, maybe she got hooked by watching the men who were uh, depicting her, right? Well, it could be. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I guess I'm I'm breathing I'm reading into it my own story because I was definitely seriously studying art, you know, before like long before I ever got into bodybuilding or anything, even, um, you know, I, I really always just saw myself as an artist. I didn't have any idea that I would ever be able to really just be an artist and make a living at it, you know, like I do now. Uh, I, I really thought I probably would be art teacher or something like that, because that was the only artists that I knew were art teachers, um, you know, my teachers, and they were not making a living doing they weren't really even showing their art or anything they were just art teachers and so you know I just didn't really know what was available in the world it seems kind of silly to say that but that's the truth uh, I just didn't know it was kind of possible and then I got into the idea of doing um, children's book illustrations because I just started thinking about how you know seeing people do it obviously and um, made some interesting first attempts at that 
uh, like really a long time ago. And um, anyway, so then I got into my bodybuilding. I had my kids and then I got into bodybuilding and was competing and really had a blast doing that. Um, and so right about did, you, time, did you bodybuild and have children later or did you have children and then bodybuild? I had children and then did the bodybuilding, but I was always really athletic. Like as a kid, I first, you know, my, I studied ballet and tap dancing and, you know, um, a lot of like gymnastics. I was on the gymnastics team at school. And um, so I, I've just always been super athletic and I really enjoyed that feeling, but I didn't really like any kind of a team sport. Like, I mean, gymnastics is a team sport, but it's still, it's more individual. You know, you're not, I, I just hated football, <laughs> any kind of thing like football or something where you're going to get hit by the other players. I just didn't want anything to do with it. <laughs> and I really didn't like either a t uh, like a coach blowing whistles at me and telling me to run and stuff. I just did not like that. But I loved the athletic, you know, the athleticism of doing those kind of things. I just didn't like the, the way it was done with the, the teachers and stuff, I guess, really, you know, the way it was organized. So an individual sport made more sense for you. Yeah, and, and I really loved it. I just loved the feeling of using your body that way, you know, the discipline and the, just the physical nature of it. Um, so, yeah, and, and so, you know, then when I had my kids um, after the youngest, well, I had two, and then after the youngest one, was about a year old, I just started feeling like I wanted to exercise again. And so um, my, the man who I was married to at the time, my husband had bought some weights for himself at home and I just started using them. I'd never done any kind of weight training before, but I figured what the heck, I'll just do it, you know? And uh, so I just loved it. I thought it was really fun. And I just got really hooked into that. And the more you do it, you know, you get really more and more hooked into it. I'm sure you can. Oh, well, I, 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 it's interesting because uh, I think it would be fair to say that uh, your, uh, your figures always tend to be very fit. Uh, uh, looking at the, the figures that you depict, uh, all of your all of your human figures tend to be uh, uh, people of significant fitness. Do you think your bodybuilding career influences that vision for your uh, for your work? Oh, definitely it does. I mean, it, it, it's just you know you get an awareness of how the body works through your own body, you know, and um, it's just a real love for the. I love I love how the body works and. Uh, but I also feel like that there's a more emotional component to that in that my work is really so about empowerment of the individual in the painting. And um, it's, you know, like, and plus like the art that I've always loved, like when you look at somebody like Muka, you don't think of him as painting strong bodybuilders or something or Waterhouse, but look at them, they've got muscles, you know, the women in those paintings are there, you see muscle there, it's a substantial figure, it's not a skinny little person that has no power, there's something powerful, real powerful to, to both of their women. Alphonse Muka is a, a, an interesting case, a, a Czechoslovakian uh, illustrator from uh, uh, the, particularly from the 30s, he did a lot of Art Deco uh, uh, stuff, uh, and he comes across as uh, you never see frail people in That's right. Muka's work. I, no, I, I mean he obviously loved the shape of muscle, and I think that probably you know maybe the models back then really were a little bit stronger. Probably people were stronger in general, before they had as many ways to not ever have to move their bodies <laughs> through the day. <laughs> you know, I mean, as time has gotten more modern, people are doing, you know, they, they can get away with doing less and less physical activity. So I'm just guessing that back then you had people who did more physical labor, I would think. Well, right? well, and 
the ubiquity of automobiles wasn't as great in the 20s yeah. and 30s. It was an expensive uh, appliance that most people didn't have. And right. Uh, uh, yeah. The doc's grandfather, who uh, died at 94, was mowing his grass with one of these. At 90, he was mowing his grass with one of these lawnmowers that doesn't have a motor, where it just you know, this little reel goes back and forth and cuts the grass. And he was doing yeah. that at 90 years old. That's now, amazing. Now we sit down to mow the grass, right? We're on the, we're on the riding yeah. lawnmower. So it's, yeah. so it's different. Um, so in your conception of the uh, figurative art, you, you do an extraordinary amount of fantasy work and, uh, uh, I, I wondered, you you started uh, your career, did you not, as pretty much an illustrator? Is that a fair characterization of, of your initial career? Yes, definitely. Um, as I mentioned, I, I originally had wanted to do children's books, um, and I still do. I still actually am making a children's book right now. Yeah. But um, children's book illustration, you know, is something that they're like through history has been such a beautiful art form and uh it just like the way i don't know it's like the fantasy the world of fantasy art incorporates all kinds of things that i just really enjoy making and visualizing and thinking about and living in that world myself you know like just the beauty of the the landscapes and um the you know, just that making their hair floating all around like it's, you know, got, I don't know, its own life to it or something. And just the, the way that it's done is so luxurious. And that's just kind of the typical way you think of fantasy. Um, everything's sparkly and beautiful. I mean, there's people who make fantasy in a more dark and kind of horror themed direction or a darker direction. But that's just not where my mind goes. I go in this more I, I love the decorative nature of it. And that goes along with the um, the Art Nouveau, Luca and, you know, all the children, the illustrators from that time, like Kay Nielsen. I don't know if you know the work of Kay Nielsen, but his mm -hmm. work is just this gorgeous designs, you know, and Beardsley and people that did these design work that to me is just uh, so inspiring. So when you migrated from and I, maybe it's unfair to say you migrated, maybe you didn't migrate, but my impression is you've migrated from pure illustration into fine art painting. And uh, there, is, there is a difference uh, between those two, uh, uh, those two genres. Would you agree with that? Well, I guess what I'm seeing is the difference because I really, don't feel like I need to stop doing illustration in order to do my own thing as well. I, I don't think that a person should only do one thing. Maybe, you know, I know some people do kind of feel like you have to get away from taking commissions in order to be pure and everything, but I, I enjoy doing commission work and I like, you know, I like private commissions when people come to me with their personal dream of, um, you know, something that they want to have. It's something that means something to them personally. And I also think it's kind of a neat puzzle to solve, you know, for um, more corporate type commissions or whatever, just because it's interesting, but also the pay is really great. You know that when you make that painting, you're gonna get paid for it. And I am still a living, breathing person that still needs to consume massive amounts of food to keep these big muscles. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have to... <laughs> so it's like, I have to... Uh, you know, still make a living. So, <laughs> you know, and it's great. I love being able to make a living painting, whether, you know, and, but, but on the other hand, I love painting my own paintings and just doing whatever I feel like doing. Well, so sometimes you know, the two can cross, you know. I, I started my career, most people don't know this, I don't talk about it much, but I, I started my career uh, out of college as a commercial photographer. And so I shot advertising pictures, uh, principally for department stores and uh, direct mail pieces and newspaper inserts and things like this. And I think it's fair to say that that 
foundation uh, influences the way I, in my own uh, fine art practice, I try to shoot fine art pictures myself today, uh, but my uh, advertising illustration work certainly did influence the way in which uh, I see. And I, I, I suspect that that might be the same for you. Absolutely. I, I really do. Definitely. I mean, you've told me, we've talked about this before, actually, because I knew that you had been this photographer and I thought that was really amazing. Um, very, very interesting. And I, I really think that when you are working, you're out in the field working as an illustrator or a commercial photographer, whatever, you're fulfilling an art director's direction and having to do it and you're competing with other people who are wanting your job, <laughs> you know, they, and you, so you have to, you're, you're competing in a field of excellent artists and it really forces you to really up your skills in a way that um, I don't think I would have been pushed that way if I had only been satisfying just myself maybe I don't really know if I had just been doing art just for the heck of my own feelings of what I wanted to do I definitely think it would be different um, but I think that having been in the position of having to come up with like especially like let's say for instance when I first started doing uh, illustration as a career uh, a lot of the jobs that I got were for video game covers back in the early 90s and it was a blast because they would send me pictures of you know what they the creatures that they wanted and it would maybe be like 10 pixels big you know so it's like 10 pixels of just like squares of maybe 20 pixels I don't know but anyway just like square blocks of color that were basically the shape of a dragon or a you know, a guy, a warrior guy or something. And and then they told me to like, okay, make a scene with these two fighting with each other. And, you know, give me some basic direction, kind of like if you're doing a book cover and they give you the idea of the story. But the thing with the video games that was funny is that I knew that I would be taking these pixels and making them into real, you know, people and creatures. And it was just a lot of fun. And it was neat to be involved with video games too, because my two sons were really, they love video games. So it was great to have them be like, oh, mom's doing video game covers. <laughs> yeah, it's so much fun. You know, when you can impress your kids, that's really fun. <laughs> every, it's every kid's fantasy, you know. Uh, it's, it's every kid's fantasy, you know. Today, you're, you're prominent in the community of uh, fantasy artists and illustrators and your personal work depicts outer space and otherly worlds and creatures that if you didn't paint them, they couldn't be imagined by the average person. They, uh, they occupy a, a, a unique place in the imagination. Um, do you have any thoughts on how you were drawn to uh, fantasy art and uh, the creation of other worlds. And in that vein, how do you, how do you go about conceptualizing uh, some of the things you do? Because I look at your work, all of which I admire uh, immensely, and I say, you know, if, if she hadn't painted that, I couldn't have thought it up myself. <laughs> truly well you know you think your own thing so but the thing is that I I just I honestly I have to say I think my brain is a little bit different and I have a um you know the part of, like we all have this part of our brain that recognizes faces I'm sure you've heard about sure. that and that you know you see faces in different things and I think that mine is kind of hyper hyperactive or hyperdeveloped or something. I don't really know, but it it's really going all the time. And I see, like, if I'm just doing anything, you know, I see in all the, like, also my vision isn't that sharp at distance. And so, you know, I'll just miss see things or I see things out of my peripheral vision. And it just really looks like an actual scene of something going on. And I have kind of just over the years, um, I enjoy that tremendously and I'll just sit and 
you know, sometimes I'll just get caught staring at space because out of the corner of my eye, I'm seeing this amazing little scene of, you know, some rabbits in a boat and they're like taken off into this cloud of this other thing. And, you know, it's like, it's just, I don't know. I, I, um, I see a lot of stuff based on just, I think the way your brain interprets shapes. And I know it's not like I'm, I'm not having delusions or something like that. So and don't, don't get scared. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just that I, my, I just see these shapes or like if I close my eyes really fast, the way that your eyelids hit your eyeballs creates a certain kind of light effect in your eyes, you know, and that sure. looks like maybe, you know, a, a nebula that's made out of lions or something to me you know, just something really cool. And then I'll think, wow, that could be a painting. And then once I decide that it could be a painting, I'll just kind of sit with it a little bit longer until I literally see it as a painting. And then I go, I can go to like the blank canvas that's sitting there and picture it on the canvas. And then I feel like I have confidence in that thing that I know I can do that thing. And then once I start doing it, it changes into something else entirely anyway. So whatever, so, uh, <laughs> you just have to so, go with it. <laughs> so do you, so when, when you conceptualize some of this and when you do these, uh, you know, you have a unique uh, talent for uh, painting uh, what I would characterize as uh, these luscious females that are, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're strong, they're healthy, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, do you use a model? Do you make oh, a yeah. photo? I, no, I, mean, I how absolutely. Do you, how do you incorporate your uh, yeah. fantastical ideas which come out of your uh, imagination? How do you uh, incorporate those ideas with uh, these depictions of human figures? Is there, a, do you use a, do you do studies? Do you do photographs? How, how does your technique work? So it's different for different things. And sometimes, for instance, if it is something that's from a client that needs specific whatever, um, then I have to go about thinking of how to solve their problem. So let's take that out of the story because that's obvious what you would do, right? So that's, uh, but if it's just my own things, I, I like to, I do work with models you know, for my figures almost all the time. The only time I would not work with a model is if I really wanted to just let it loose. And uh, that's very rare for me to do anything that goes in that direction. But um, I work with models, I shoot photographs, or I do like to work from life as well. But mostly they're the things that you see are from photographs. And my favorite way to do things is to have the model come over and it's somebody that, you know, I kind of understand their style and they can just, well, I'll give them a starting point and then just go for it. They start doing whatever and do a bunch of poses and you know, spend a couple of hours shooting a ton of pictures and then um, don't look at them for a month or two because it's different when you first see it to later on and you see it again. Um, then you know, I'll go back and I'll just look at them and some of them will really jump out at me and I'll just feel like really strongly about those and I'll take those and save them and, and then keep them and kind of decide like which ones really, really are the most powerful to me, which ones just give me a certain feeling, which I don't have words for, but there is a specific feeling that I get when I just feel like something is going to work. And uh, sometimes I have an idea ahead of time what I want to do and sometimes I just let that photo inspire me sometimes I'll actually take the photo and I'll just start you know putting it out on on my canvas and then as I'm doing it you know I let some paint fly around and then things start to take shape and they suggest a certain story to me and if I start I just get that there's that specific feeling that I mentioned whenever I get that feeling I kind of just follow that and um so you know, it's an so intuitive some, it's an intuitive process on that's one. my favorite way to work yeah, yeah yeah and there are times that i that i really do have an intention i have a story in mind i have a feeling of you know something i want to portray and then you know i'll go about it more in a way that i would if it was for a client's work where i get a model that's specific to whatever it is i want to do 
and um, you know, have that model pose for me in a certain way. I, I may have a sketch for them ahead of time. And sometimes I'll have a sketch, but it'll deviate from the sketch. You know, it's not going to be exactly the sketch. But um, so do you, know, you I let do the a, model do a grisai? Do you do you do a, yeah. gris, mm -hmm. a grisai from a from a photograph that you then transfer to the you then transfer to the canvas? Is that kind of one of the right. things you do? Yep, that's what I do. And yeah, and then I um, you know after I have that on my canvas, then I, I make the whole canvas have some paint on it somewhere. So, that, and then depending on how much intention I had ahead of time, you know, if I had no intention ahead of time, I can just kind of let the shapes suggest a cool story to me. Or if I had an intention ahead of time, then I, you know, have to build whatever it is. And, get more reference. Maybe I need a bunch of zebras or something. I don't know. So <laughs> it depends. So um, what about the creatures? You, you do a lot of, of uh, fantasy work where you create these, uh, sometimes they're quite billowing. You know, you have these, uh, I, I, you, you spend a lot of time in, in what appears to be space or flying or clouds. Uh, how do, how do your creatures come to you? How do you conceptualize your creatures? Because some of them are truly otherworldly. They don't really have cognates in nature, as near as I can tell. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I do, you know, I have my dogs and I look at my dogs all day long. And I've always loved dogs and horses, especially all animals, really. But especially dogs and horses have been a big part of my life for my whole life. And um, so a lot of my creatures are kind of coming from the direction of that, um, you know, that anatomy a little bit. But, um, but also a lot of times what I like to do is I just let a shape happen. And then that shape will, you know, like sometimes I'll, I'll put down a big shape and then I don't look at it for a long time. And then when I come back to it, maybe I turn it upside down and I see a different thing. You know, it's like, there's so many ways that you can let your brains, that face recognition thing work for you, you know? And if you, you have your, you have it sitting across the room while you're doing your stationary bike and you're just kind of looking at it out of the corner of your eye, you just start to see it. And it just is like, oh my God, that guy, you know, that guy over there, that's how his teeth work. I had no idea, you know, so I really feel like I let these kind of things inspire me and try to leave myself open to that kind of inspiration as much as I can, because I get more unusual things that way. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, I, I, I have another question, and that is, um, you principally uh focus on female figures is that a fair characterization for you it is yeah, yeah. and it, it, talk about that how does that how does that come to be for you that you're attracted to female figures uh, more than male figures is that because it makes your narrative easier or uh, what is it i think um you know, first of all, when I first started doing what I do, that was kind of what was called for business-wise, you know, what they wanted from me mostly. Although on the video game covers, there were a lot of male figures. Yeah. Uh, but I also, I have to say, really, I think a lot of my paintings are, uh, in, the, in a way, they're self-portraits. And, you know, it's just a, I don't know, I think, I mean, I think all humans, are beautiful to look at and you know seeing how any and i mean a human animal is beautiful to me the way a horse or you know it's like they're just a beautiful creature that has this gorgeous muscles and moves in a certain way and um i don't know i just i feel like the the females it's something that it's hard for me to say exactly why but i think there's a certain kind of flow or a certain kind of uh, gracefulness there that maybe like I used to study a lot of ballet as I mentioned but um, there's a gracefulness there that happens and I like giving that also a certain power you know I think that's such a neat mixture that um, I really relate to that so I guess a lot of it is 
a feeling of my own wanting to feel that way, you know? Sure, sure. Yeah. And so, you know, the audience uh, uh, is principally for Bennett related activity, the audience is principally women. So if you take Bennett Schmidt, Bennett Schmidt uh, prize, the Bennett prize or the Bennett collection, it's a women painting women entirely and so forth. What kind of suggestions would you have for uh, women figurative painters? Uh, how, does, how does one become adept at uh, depicting depicting the human body. Uh, what are what suggestions do you make to somebody who's just, you know, you've been at this a very long time. What suggestions do you make to somebody who's uh, trying to get their bearings as a figurative artist? Mm. Well, um, I think first of all, you definitely should be studying, having, you know, um, you should be studying a lot of original art that you admire, that you aspire to. So you should be going to museums or galleries or someplace where you can see the actual original art, not necessarily a reprint of something, you know, but um, seeing a painting in person, if, assuming that you're painting, I'm just assuming that because that's, that's what I do. So we're gonna talk painting. Sure. Um, and when you see a painting in person, you can, it's like, if you stand in front of that painting in a museum, if they let you get close enough, don't throw cream on it. Don't do that. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but um, you're standing in front of it and you imagine to yourself that it's on your own easel and uh, even pretend to be holding a brush, you know, and just kind of going in your mind as if you were painting it, what would you do different? And it's gonna be that artist is teaching you at that moment what they did that's not what you do. And so it, it's like, if you want, if you love the skin tones of Bouguereau's art, let's say for instance, I love the skin tones of, everybody loves Bouguereau's art because his skin tones are so beautiful. Right. I mean, I think everybody does. Anyway, so it's just, you can't sure. deny his skin tones are gorgeous. Right. Um, his so edges. Standing in front of, excuse me? His edges too, I, you know, I exactly. don't know. I don't know how he right. does those edges, but. No, that's right. So you're standing there and you're looking at it and then, and you're really observing every little thing as if it was your own painting. Um, you're gonna learn what did he do? If it's in a print, you're not gonna really get to see all those details and the, the nuances and the colors and the values and everything and the brush strokes. And, you know, you just can't really see it the same way. So I, that's a really, I, to me, that was a huge deal when I got to start seeing original paintings. And I would, you know, Boris, my husband, watching him paint um, really taught me a lot as well. Of course, he's the one who taught me how to use oil paints the way I, when I first started, that was my teacher. Um, so I think that having a teacher is really important, you know, and sometimes I guess people don't have a teacher or maybe they don't have teachers that they haven't found a teacher that's a really their teacher, you know, you need to find the teacher that teaches what you want to know. If you're looking to paint, it depends on what you want, you know, if you want to paint realistic, I'm thinking in terms of the way I work, you know, right, you right. Realism and, and, sure. And just, yeah. and just for the sake of the audience who may not know, you're married to Boris Vallejo, uh, uh, and uh, he, in his own right, is a well-known and well-respected uh, fantasy artist and uh, figurative painter. Although right. I would say, uh, being familiar with the work of both of you, uh, you paint differently one from the other. You, uh, uh, you may have been his student, but uh, it is apparent that you have evolved your own style over time. Yeah. Um, right, I definitely have. I, um, yeah, and I enjoy that process too a lot. You know, it's really great, and I'm happy that you know we can sit and paint together. Sometimes we do commissions where we do a collaborative painting, and um, you know, it's that's another thing that's really fun is to do where he does part of it and I do part of it, um, and to just really kind of try so to make it. Tell me so how, you it. how you divide. Uh, it's well, interesting, the thought of a four-handed painting. Uh, yeah. 
uh, do you say I'll do the female figure, you do the male figure, or how do we you do that how do you sometimes? Do, how do you yeah. divide the labor in a four-handed painting? Yeah, there are times that we will say you'll do this figure and I'll do that figure, you know, or you'll do uh, the drawing of it and um, I'll do the painting of it, you know, you'll do just different parts of it, but often um, what we do is we just all do all of it <laughs> because it's really kind of gets passed back and forth and you know nobody really like we both want the same thing neither we never like people always say this is a big question is do you ever fight about it <laughs> and it's like we really don't fight about it because we both have the same goal in mind which is to really have a great painting at the end and, so so um, uh, when do you decide that a four-handed painting I mean, there's all these decisions that have to be made. When do you decide that the painting's finished? Uh, I guess it's just kind of apparent and the time runs out. <laughs> so it's, some, some of both, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I can see where that, that's one way, that's one way to decide a painting's finished. Yeah. Well, uh, we got it, we, they're arriving soon. We <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, but I mean, I'm sure you must have run into this when you were, you must have worked in the done dark room work, of course, right? Of course, You've done, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. Right? Doing your photography. And I, you know, we used to do all of our own photography, or we do our own photography, but we used to develop all of our own film. We had our dark room downstairs and we did the whole thing. Uh, of course, now it's digital. We don't do that same thing. But anyway, when we did do that and we did a lot of photography as photography, um, that was a very interesting learning experience because you you do start to see where you know there's a never ending perfectionism there that like to decide which one is the right exposure which one is the right amount of you know how did you develop this and make it printed into a print which one is the right one you know but it's like <laughs> that you just have to pick one and go with it and it's kind of like that with your painting if you if you feel like you know this one area I, you know, this happens a lot with painters that they'll fall in love with one area and it'll be great. It'll be so well done. And then there's the rest of the painting. They just aren't even that interested in it. And it's sometimes that works, but sometimes it really doesn't. And they just haven't addressed certain problems because they're so in love with the one spot that they that they love. So it's really important to keep that perspective and not, you know, not let yourself be hypnotized by that one thing that you love. But in, you know, what we were saying about with the photography thing is like, I think it's just, you know, when you finish a painting, it's kind of similar to when you choose the right print that you've printed in your dark room, just based on, you got to pick one. You got to just, you just have to decide. Well, and one of the problems with photography is of course that uh, the variations are endless and That's you, it. you can, you can print 500 copies of a, a single negative yeah. and every none no two will be alike so you exactly. have to kind of settle on uh you have to settle on i one of the worst things that ever happened was when kodak i was a black and white shooter as an artist and uh kodak invented poly contrast paper which meant that with a series of filters that you could uh, put between the negative and the the printing paper you could make it more contrasty or less contrasty in the final print. And uh, I, was, I was always very wasteful because I was always looking for that exact point of contrast. Now in an electronic world, it's much easier, uh, much easier oh, yeah. to do because you can see it on the screen and you just turn it. Yeah, right. yeah, you can, you know, Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever makes it everything. No, so but I know what you're talking about. And that's exactly it, you know, that you just you the, uh, the it's endless. And it's the same with painting. You could go on painting forever, you know, perfecting and perfecting. But. You know. Absolutely, absolutely. And so You've said that uh, you were an oil painter. Um, how did you come? How did you come to that? Um, uh, as distinct from being a pastel artist or a uh, someone who paints with acrylics, uh, you you paint 
mainly in oils. And uh, my experience with you is that your substrate is very often bored. Um, and talk about those choices and how you got to them. Well, um, okay, so the, as I mentioned that Boris is, was my initial teacher, that's what he paints with is oil and he paints on illustration board. Right. Uh, um, and I, uh, before I knew him, I had done a few oil paintings, but honestly, I just really had done mostly acrylic or watercolor and ink and that kind of stuff because I was really scared of oil. And I, I thought it was a much bigger, scarier thing than it really is. I didn't know how beautifully forgiving and, you know, endlessly workable oil is. It's just, it's like, Wow. It's a it's a heck, it's a heck of a lot better than acrylic and oh uh, yeah and it's I for tough some to reason layer acrylic right yeah I think I mean there are people who do amazing things with acrylic but it's like with oil you could I don't know it's like you just have so much flexibility and I um, for some reason I and other people have thought that oil was going to be much much more difficult because it gets muddy if you don't control your colors and that kind of thing but once you understand you know, anything about that stuff, you know, what makes it muddy and how do you avoid that and whatever, then it's really not a problem. Not even have to think about it anymore. Right. So when you um, get when you give it up at the end of the night, what do you do? What do you do with your your palette and your brushes and this sort of thing? Do you start over? Oh, with the palette, I close it up. I've got it in one of these plastic boxes that has a top on it. Uh, it keeps the dust out, you know, and the sure. dog hairs. <laughs> <It's just like, laughs> And keeps it from getting turned over, which I've done before. <laughs> so yeah, I close it up and I do wash my brushes uh, almost every time I use them because um, I used to not really do that. And it's like, why am I not washing my brushes every day? It's so much nicer to come in to clean brushes in the morning, you know? Well, there are some people that uh, put their brushes in a, a, a glass jar and then cover the jar with a rag, stuff a jar or uh, rag soaked in turpentine to kind of keep everything, keep everything loose and keep it from drying out and this sort of thing. I have not heard about that. That's interesting. Well, I was talking, uh, interestingly, to an acrylic painter and she was talking about uh, keeping her brushes basically in this super humid atmosphere where uh, uh, covered with a very wet rag to try and keep this paint from solidifying and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, let's face it, a clean brush is so much easier to work with. If you get a I don't know fleck of junk yeah. in it it's hard right? it's I know and the thing is that also I, I would be worried that over time having your brush in such an environment you know is going to make the wood and the glue that holds the brush together kind of start to would it hurt the brush I would think it would. oh sure it would I, I'm, yeah. I'm sure it does but there are some people some people who get along uh, who do fine that yeah. way right that's and, interesting yeah you know, I, I do, I, know. do I understand why it is I'm not sure I'm not mm -hmm. sure I do uh, you know everybody has a different technique um, yeah well of course never washes his brushes I don't know he's crazy <laughs> he does so, not wash his brushes so when you wash your brush do you wash it with uh turpentine or mineral well I use or? Yeah, I use I use uh, odorless paint thinner when I'm painting. Yeah, and so it's um, it's not actually turpentine; it's some kind of other version of that that's not as toxic, I suppose. I don't really know, but um, anyway, so I use that when I'm painting, and then at the end of painting, I you know I swish it out in that, and then I put it in this stuff called Simple Green, which is like a yeah. water based stuff that you clean your house with and so you wash it out with that and that kind of takes off most of the solvent and stuff and then after that I put it in brush soap and there's a special soap that's made for brushes and I put it in that brush soap and then just wash it out with water and it's really easy. Simple green cuts uh, 
anything that's oil based simple green eats it somehow yeah and it's water based i don't understand how it works i don't but either it, but yeah. it, it's really cool so mm -hmm. talk about how when your painting is done uh what do you do varnish gambar uh what yeah. is what is your finish paint? well so i learned a new thing not too long ago um before varnishing it, if you have the time, if you don't have like a, some deadline that you've got to send it to somebody or whatever right away, assuming you have the time, you let it dry and then you put on a mixture of um, not, not Gamvar, but the, uh, what's the Gamsol? Gamsol. With Gal, Gamsol and Galkid, half and half. And you mix that together and then you brush that on and you kind of blot it off so that it's just a really thin amount of that on top of there. So now you have something that's gonna bring all your colors up and help you know that you don't have any areas that are mistakes. You know, maybe there's some areas, like sometimes when it's dry and it's not varnished yet, you can't tell that there's some areas where it doesn't look right. So you put this stuff on, you let it dry. It's dry by the next day. And then if you need to fix anything, you go ahead and fix it. And if you can let that dry for a day or two before you varnish it, it makes it better so that, uh, and then I varnish it with the Gamvar after that. But uh, that will make it so that the varnish is easier to remove should you need to remove it and it won't be going onto your paint that way. Kind of yeah. a layer in between the paint and the varnish. <clears throat> well, you know, one of the things I've been concerned about as a collector is the fact that uh, you frequently fear that you're going to have to uh, restore a painting. Uh, yeah. And I've worried that the tendency of people to uh, uh, varnish before the oil is fully dry creates a, a bond between the uh, varnish and the paint so that if you came back later, a hundred years later, something you have to remove this finish, it's full of dust, it's yellowing, whatever. You have to remove it, but to get it off, you may have to invade the paint layer, which really carries with it a lot of risks about destroying the artist's intention. That's so, right, you got it. You said it and it's exactly true. And the thing is that how many people are going to let their painting sit for six months before they varnish it, you know? Well, you know, if you if you ask the scientists, they will say, you know, my conservator would say one to two years minimum before you apply the finish code. Well, yeah. it's a great idea. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great idea if you're independently wealthy. Right. Uh, or your collectors are willing to wait around for a couple of years. It's a very difficult yeah. thing. Um, but if you do this other process, you kind of, I mean, I, I, uh, the people at Gamblin are extremely help, helpful um, in helping you with materials. And of course, they're going to be telling you about their materials, but they have really good products, you know, but they are the ones who told me about this process of putting the, the Galkid mixed with the Gamsol first let yeah. that dry and then you can you can paint on that and you can you can use that process that during your process of painting as well and it helps you to keep um your colors true so that you know what you're doing you don't lose your way because your paint's all matted and everything um but it also fortifies your paint and makes your paint stronger and more less likely to crack down the road so this is what they've told me. And I really believe that it's the truth because I can just like, it's such a pleasure to paint on it too. When you put that layer on there, if you need to, if you need to paint on it more, if you just want to paint on it, you can do that in between and use that as a layer. Um, but I have removed varnish from that before because I had a painting that had some problems and I had to remove the varnish and redo some stuff. And it really does, it does what she told me that it did not disturb the paint underneath when I did that. Wow, that's a that's a very helpful hint. Yeah, uh, and the Gamvar supposedly will not yellow. It's a um, synthetic varnish, so as opposed to Demar varnish, which is a natural thing that will yellow. But the Gamvar, she said, I mean, it hasn't been a hundred years since they made it, so we don't really know. But 
I I feel like that it's it's got good science behind it, and uh, I trust the Gimbar. Well, uh, uh, I guess we won't know whether Gambar uh, yellows or not, at least not in this lifetime, but somebody no. be, somebody in the future might find out for sure. Um, I, I'm confident that Gambar has done enough testing to fairly, uh, uh, fairly represent the notion that it is not yeah. going to yellow. Um, it's right. always a little bit of an, an enigma, however, because until you've lived it, you're never really sure, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, right. and every organic product, whether it's a dam or varnish or uh, uh, copal varnish or, you know, copal varnish and orange turpentine, there's all these ways to do it. But all of those are known, all, all uh, uh, terp and organic varnish combinations are known to yellow with age. Uh, yeah. and, and frankly, there's a lot of uh, artists out there now who are making paintings that are finished with uh, resin. And I'm fearful that resin coated paintings are going to yellow relatively quickly. Um, I don't know that I have any mm. proof but I have my suspicions, I guess, would mm -hmm. be fair to say. So you uh, have graciously agreed to serve as a juror for the Bennett Prize. And thank you for that. I know Dr. Schmidt and I are deeply grateful. Uh, well, thank you for asking me to. I can't tell you how honored I am, seriously. I mean, it's I really, really look up to what you guys are doing and the artists that participate every year. I, I'm really, really honored that you would ask me to be part of that. Well, we think, uh, we think a great deal of your work and uh, we think your process and your judgment are uh, uh, perfect for a prize that's designed for women figurative painters. So uh, you'll bring uh, a wealth of experience, know-how and success uh, to the judging process. Um, one of the uh, uh, stated uh, objectives of the prize is to propel the careers of uh, women figurative realist painters. And we've taken realism and interpreted realism as a uh, fairly broad idea. It is not photographic realism necessarily, although it could be, uh, it could be fairly impressionistic also. Um, but one of the premises that we proceeded uh, from is the idea that uh, women have been held back by big art uh, or have not received the recognition uh, they deserve. Um, uh, the guerrilla girls who at one time were very intense about no shows in big museums and so forth. We have tended to agree with those ideas. I, I'm wondering if you can share some of your own thoughts on the way in which the pro, assuming you agree with the premise, on the way in which the problem of uh, women's representation in art can be addressed. Well, I mean, I really think what you guys, I mean, definitely what you're doing is awesome that it's directed to that. And not only that, but it, talking about it and you know put the spotlight on it and bring it out as like this is happening this is what we're doing about it you know and it's just great to bring it out in the open that way you know and just the straightforwardness of it i love that yeah um yeah and i you know i mean you know we all know that uh like we were talking before about the women who were models and then became artists later on um, and how the rooms were all just men before that. It's just the way it's been. I don't, you know, um, it's, it's one of these things that's extremely slow to change, I guess. And I do, I do think things are changing, but extremely slowly. <laughs> and uh, I just, you know, I mean, I'm not sure what I could add to this conversation because we all know what's the deal. It's just so, um, it's so horribly unfair to think of like half the human race is 
not <laughs> considered up to snuff just you know that just doesn't make sense you know well and there's like so, so many different different ideas to be presented and from the point of view of a female i mean i know lots you know men are very interested in females point of view about what's sexy or what's beautiful or all kinds of different things you know what's important what's poetic what's you know so many things like whatever but it, it's like and it is a different point of view from a masculine point of view often but it's well just the really... female get the female gaze and the male gaze we've for many years uh, there's been this discussion about how they're different and how they overlap and so forth but um, it is clear to us that uh, galleries, uh, we just came back from Santa Fe and you can walk through some galleries and fire a cannon off and not hit a female artist, wow. you know, work, work by a, a female painter, for example. Um, so that's always a trick. Um, I think that in the, in the Western art, it might be even, I mean, I know you were probably not looking at Western art galleries, I would assume, right? Well, I went, to, uh, the doc and I visited dozens of them and yes, you know, what I, I would call, say in the Western art, in the Western art world, I do think it is more male dominated than any other section. You know, I, 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 I don't mean to be denigrating, but you know, I frequently will refer to a lot of Western art as Marlboro man, yeah. <laughs> Mar Marlboro man paintings and uh, yep. <laughs> uh, that seems to be uh, a very male dominated sphere more so. Yep. Um, I would agree. As a lot more. Um, I would agree for sure. So as you anticipate judging the Bennett Prize, uh, do you have any uh, uh, expectations or comments on what you're going to be looking for or advice for would-be contestants? I, I would not be giving advice, but I can tell you I'm really ex super excited to see what's going to happen because, um, I mean, what I personally love to see in art is someone's authenticity is such a big deal to me and that I feel that this person is doing something that is me. You can feel it when somebody is doing work that's meaningful to themselves and they're not just trying to, you know, imitate somebody else or anything like that. I, I really feel like that to me is such a big deal. And it, and it has a power. I'm, I just, I remember I read a book when I was a kid about how the ring of truth has power like nothing else, you know? And I feel like that this is so much in art. You know, if you have your ring of truth there, that right there, even without your painting technique and all that, the ring of truth is, is there or not there. Oh, that's, that's a big deal to me. You know, that ring of truth uh, is uh, such an important, uh, such an important feature to all this. And maybe that's the point at which, uh, maybe that's the point at which we wrap this conversation. Uh, you've been a wonderful, uh, a, a wonderful guest. And uh, certainly it has been a fascinating hour. Um, as Thank I've, you so much for having me. I mean, Stephen, I really am enjoying this whole thing already. <laughs> and just having this chat with you and being able to present these ideas is so much fun and, and just really such an honor. Thank you. Uh, as we wrap up, let me say again that the doc and I are uh, very sincerely looking forward to being with you at the opening of the uh, Bennett Prize 3.0 exhibition at the Muskegon Museum of Art, which will open in May of 2023. And I personally very much look forward to working with you and judging the competition uh, this fall. Yes, uh, I can't wait. Very exciting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my guest has been the well-known fantasy and wildlife artist, Julie Bell. Just as a reminder, uh, these are the important dates. The call for entry for the Bennett Prize closes on October 7th of 2022. The top 10 finalists will be announced on November 29th and the opening and announcement of the winners will be announced at the Muskegon Museum of Art in Muskegon, Michigan on May 18th, 2023. The exhibition of the work of the 3.0 finalists and the solo exhibition of the 2021 winner Ayana Ross will be on view from May 19th to September 10th, 2023 
and will then travel the country for the following two years. So if you're an eligible woman painter, please consider becoming a contestant for the Bennett Prize 3.0, the call for entries for which is open now. The complete rules for entry are available at www.thebennettprize.org. Thank you again, Julie, great to see you. So Thank long, you everybody. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. So long, everybody. Bye. Thanks.